We now learn from the Defense Department that Kim Jong-un may have the ability to deliver a hydrogen bomb within the next six to 18 months. And it's obvious that they have the potential right now to be able to reach uh, not only the Pacific region, but obviously reach uh, even the United States. That's a direct threat to the national security of the United States. Hydrogen bombs or thermonuclear weapons are also known as fusion bombs because they require a fusion reaction between hydrogen isotopes. But a fusion reaction requires an enormous amount of energy to trigger it. That energy is produced from an A-bomb. So in essence, an H-bomb requires an A-bomb inside it to set it off. The Hiroshima A-bomb dropped in Japan in 1945 was recorded to have released about 15 kilotons of energy and carried a blast radius of 1.6 kilometers. The minimum yield an H-bomb produces is one megaton and has a blast radius of around 30 kilometers. There is also no limit to how big an H-bomb can be, unlike the A-bomb. But compared to its potential power, it is said to be quite easy to develop once an atomic bomb has been produced. Here to assess the North Korean provocations and the appropriate U.S. response, joining us tonight, retired four-star General Jack Keane, Fox News military analyst. General, great to have you here. Good to be here, Lou. I, I swear, the news just continues to worsen uh, from all of our uh, intelligence analysts uh, and, and, and when it comes to North Korea. Now, suddenly, they have the ability to develop a hydrogen bomb within six to 18 months. First of all, that's a huge spread of time. Uh, but as early as six months, that's indeed troubling. Yeah, it certainly is. And listen, gone are the days now that we would ever take lightly what North Korea says, because the truth is they have indeed delivered on the things they talk about. They, they've got medium-range ballistic missiles, submarine-launched ballistic missiles. They're developing intercontinental ballistic missiles, and they, ha and they obviously have a capability there as well. So if they say they're, they're about to build a hydrogen bomb, our intelligence services pick that up, certainly that's likely the case, and so our viewers understand, certainly atomic weapons are alone devastating devices, a hydrogen bomb is just so many times more lethal, where it actually winds up killing millions of people versus tens of thousands or hundreds, hundreds of thousands. Uh, and it's a little bit more challenging to put it on an ICBM because it's a heavier weapon, but uh, we got to take it seriously what, what, what they're about. And, and, and of course, I, I think it just strengthens our resolve to put on fast forward everything that we're going to do to North Korea short of war and let's get on with it in terms of what the other countries are doing and ourselves with North Korea, what we intend to do with China and get tough with China about a policy that means leveraging North Korea appropriately. Six months away from a hydrogen bomb. Uh, with the threats getting nastier and uh, more dramatic from Kim Jong-un, it seems, by the week. Uh, what is the time frame here for President Trump to act as best we can assess? Well, I, I think we're, we're kind of out of time, I, you know, in terms of realistically probably six months to a year. And, and who wants to bet on that scenario? So I, I, I'm, I'm serious. We, we got to put this thing on fast forward. And let's stop talking about it and let's start acting. China first tested an atomic bomb in 1964. They tested their first H-bomb in 1967. It only took two years and eight months to develop. More now with my wide-ranging interview with former Defense Secretary and CIA Director Leon Panetta. It feels that the North Korea situation has become incredibly dangerous in the last few months. Uh, what's your take on, on, on this latest uh, provocation where you have North Korea uh, uh, launching the first intercontinental ballistic missile hidden from spy satellites until just before it was rolled into launch position and aimed into space? Maria, there's, uh, there's a number of uh, flashpoints in the world, dangerous flashpoints in the world, that are uh, confronting uh, our country and challenging our national security. But probably the most dangerous right now is North Korea.
and let's start trying to get some some true uh, results here. And it, we're going to have to be tough with the Chinese. They've been gaming us. Come on, we know they are. And uh, the Chinese helped them get nuclear weapons. The, the, the Ballistic missiles that they're developing, that we're watching, look very similar to Chinese ballistic missiles. So they're obviously using their technology. So the Chinese are, are helping the, the North Koreans with this capability. At a, at a minimum, they're tolerating it. And if they're going to do anything here, we've got to get them moving in that direction now. Take the gloves off and start dealing with them. I think that um, there's no doubt that we could annihilate North Korea militarily. There's no doubt about that. The real dilemma in what defense policies referred to is um, asymmetric retaliation. Essentially, they would be able to get a punch off. And with, uh, you know, uh, short-range missiles that can be hidden in hidden areas on you know, pre-fueled and track launchers, there's a chance that they could land one uh, missile. And we just don't want to see any loss of life well, at all. Seoul is one of the most densely populated cities in the entire world in South Korea. Uh, millions of people. But if we, do, we have a chart up on the wall as well that shows the amount of North Korean ground forces, almost a million, 950,000. I don't, I, don't, I don't know the exact number of U.S. troops on that peninsula, but it's, it's only tens of thousands. Uh, some have described our defenses there. If, they, if North Korea really wanted to press the offensive as a speed bump, only a delay mechanism for their forces, a ground war uh, is even more dangerous than, in, than people think. Absolutely. And the work that we've done, Pete, with veterans, I mean, we've obviously seen the, uh, the, the real sides of war. This is global chess with consequences. We don't want to see that, so there's going to be several steps. But I think in the meantime, you know, defense experts, we think we could probably shoot down some of these. We're working in that direction, uh, but trying to get some pressure and hopefully some of our regional allies, especially China, can try to push this guy back. He's more than just a guy with a really bad haircut. He's dangerous, so we need to do something about it. And what you're saying it. is if we, if we preemptively act, take out some of their nuclear facilities or other uh, intercontinental ballistic uh, systems, we have to be, we better get it all right because all they need is one to respond in a way that, that's meaningful to us. Absolutely correct. And I know we're trying to get uh, advanced missile defense systems into South Korea working in that direction. The top security officials of South Korea, the United States, and Japan held their first three way video conference call on deterring further threats from the Kim Jong un regime. During the 70 minute long meeting that began at 9 p.m. Thursday, Korea time, Seoul's National Security Office Chief Chung Woo Yong and his American and Japanese counterparts, H.R. McMaster and Shotaro Yachi, agreed that Pyongyang's ICBM launch posed a great threat to peace and the stability of the Korean Peninsula, Northeast Asia, and the wider international community. North Korea fired off two ICBMs in July alone and the top security advisors reached an understanding that they won't sit back and watch them continue. The three parties agreed to maximize pressure on North Korea, including through UN Security Council resolutions, to prevent future provocations. North Korea has criticized South Korea's efforts to try and denuclearize the regime. On the state-sponsored news website Uri Min Giri on Friday, a statement slammed Seoul's plans to have a nuclear-free peninsula by 2020, which was part of the Moon administration's five-year policy agenda announced last month. The statement called it reckless and defended Pyongyang's nuclear weapons as a righteous option for self-defense against the U.S. It added that having the nuclear issue as a precondition for improving inter-Korean relations will never work. The statement also called President Moon's Berlin Declaration in July, where he declared he would try to engage in dialogue with the regime to end board hostilities and restart separated family reunions, as an intolerable insult to the North. However, the statement makes no direct reference to those offers of talks and therefore has not been considered a response which Seoul is still waiting for. Meanwhile, Pyongyang has also slammed the US for its ban on travel to the regime. In a statement released by the state-run Korea Central News Agency, Pyongyang has called the move a dirty scheme to prevent U.S. citizens from seeing North Korea as it is and that it shows that Washington views the regime as an enemy. 
The travel ban comes in reaction to the death of a U.S. student, Otto Wombier, who was detained by the North Korean authorities for 17 months before being sent back to the U.S. in a comatose state in June. The circumstances of his detainment and subsequent injuries still remain unclear. This bird is seriously dangerous but beautiful. Thank you for watching Right Wing. Your support really does mean the world to me. I hope you have an amazing rest of the day and I will see you tomorrow.